remember the last time we had time to work on this, we didn't really finish diffuse formers. We'll try to get most of the rest of these put in today, and maybe get the blocks installed, get them ready to be hollowed out. But what what happens this time of year? You really have no control over it. It's the holiday season. People come to visit, and you just get in the middle of a job when you have to tape. We had a we had a pretty good dissertation about how to lay out these formers. So there's no point stretching this out, making it any longer. It has to be. I only have to go up to the wing saddle on these. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to, what my plan is, is to finish all of them right up to the front, put maybe even a, a light ply one up here that I can bolt some nose weight to. And then I want to leave the last two that will be where the wing actually will install, and I'll need to make them out of eighth inch plywood. And that'll be, after all of these are laid in and everything is square and 90 degrees, that should really, I, I'm assuming that'll be the best way to do it. We'll find out. Again, because we're doing something totally new, the adventure of it all. And then, of course, once all the formers are in, getting the blocks rough shaped. This is an exciting part of it. This is this is a part I really like. Once these formers are done, and again, with holiday season here, you don't get any real dedicated time. You get bits and pieces. Now, as I'm laying out the the formers that'll go in by the wing saddles, I'm putting them in randomly. I thought about leaving these oversized just to give this a little support and I went, I didn't want to do that because when I make the cut for the wing I don't want to be cutting through the formers and it's probably going to just make a mess out of things if I do that. What I really want to do is I want to have them end right where the wing, where we've drawn all our little center lines for the wing. And so the tail on this, the, the, the back part of it is really nice in fact. That, that worked out perfectly. Now these formers, it's a question of I fit them to the width and then I cut, trim each one before I actually glue it in. Now what I'll do is just make a support piece, a side to side, a piece of scrap here as a better way of doing it, of keeping it that you don't squeeze it when we're carving the blocks. The reason I didn't want to do the formers again is when you go to cut this piece out, and I don't want to cut that out until I the last minute, until everything's carved and hollowed and everything. So this will give me a little bit of an insurance thing that uh, I'm not going to wind up cutting through those formers since we've got it marked on both sides now, so it's not a problem. I should, they should actually go right up to where the formers are and that would be fine. And we're going to, all this is speculative until we find out. And the ones in the front will be real easy, they're all 90 degrees, just working their way right up. Now as we're filling up this fuselage with form, as it's really starting to take shape. And the last piece here is going to be the nose. And then from that I'll make the two ends. You see I've left the two pieces missing so that I can get the, uh, and they'll have to be eighth inch ply with the, the bulkheads so to speak that are going to hold this. So when I take the wing and the cells out, this will remain nice and rigid. That is the first time I've got to look at it from straight on the top to see how straight it is. And this is really, this, this really came out nice and straight. Now I have the two bulkheads to make up. I'm going to make them up at eighth inch plywood. They'll ultimately have a lot of lightning holes and things in them. But for right now, I'm just going to leave them marked as we will or try to figure out if we do need lightning holes where they should be. What I've been doing is just sighting down to see that, I, that I've created it. Or that, that that center line hasn't turned into a banana and it's so far it's been real good. But what I'll do, I'll make up two patterns for these two parts, the forward one and the rear one. Making these two patterns up, the, the important thing is I'll pass them on to Dave Downey so he can replicate them, lay them out on a plan somewhere. And if we the day comes and we're gonna build a second B twenty five, having all these patterns, of course cut the time to cut it in half easily. These pieces up, I have some scrap balsa left over which will be fine. I cut it just a little bit oversized so that I can't really, by, when I put it in position I have to squeeze it. Now I want to have the parts just a little bit oversized because I don't want to cut this out of plywood and then have to wind up um, <laughs> making a whole new part balsa would certainly a lot cheaper than plywood when you have to throw a piece away. So by having this piece, now I need to know 
how much higher than this because I figured I could get I could add it about another inch to this piece anytime I'm adding a piece to the top or bottom of the former I need to get a, a relatively straight joint there I just thought I'd show one of these I've only had to do about four or five of them for all practical purposes most of these formers are under four inches and we have four inch wood the whole key to this whole deal is having 90 degree corners on everything. Now, in this case, because I want to add some length to this, I want to make sure I'm not changing this part. And then when I take the tape off, needless to say, Again, we've just made each former exactly the same. The ones that are oversized. The thing with this pattern is to get the part, because I want the pattern to be very accurate also. Get this exactly 90 degrees. what I've been doing, I've been just looking straight down from the top to make sure I have all these formers in 90 degrees to that center line. Then once I have this, it'll be a no big deal, I'll just trace it out on eighth inch plywood. I know this is the size I need. This will be a pretty accurate replication. Now we know we can make this up just a tad oversized, maybe the pen line, and then sand it to get it in position. And I'll mark this up that this is the pattern that we actually use for that fuselage station where the wing is going to attach. This will be an eighth inch plywood bulkhead. Now I marked what it is, now it's just a question of tracing this out on a sheet of eighth inch plywood and cutting it out accurately. And when you want to cut real accurate lines with a jigsaw, one of the tricks is put a brand new blade in. When the blade gets worn, that's when you get these wavy cuts. I can reconfirm that I have all 90 degree angles and edges in this. Because the eighth inch plywood, and by the way, I've tried several different materials to replace the eighth inch plywood. The plywood is still the material of choice for this for this type of a part. Now I want to take, I just want to confirm that I have this right on the money. And I'll get a brand new blade in that jigsaw and try to get a real nice cut on this. Once I have this cut out of eighth inch plywood, the part that's going up into the fuselage, I don't need to have eighth inch plywood, but I want it to be one continuous piece. So I can put some lightning areas in here. The piece down at the bottom will stay perfectly solid. This is where we're actually going to hook the blind nuts and the bolts and everything when we make that part that goes on the wing. Now I made this, what I hope is going to be a relatively accurate template. This piece of material we don't need, this will be in the upper fuselage, but it should give it some rigidity. The motor will, the motor, the, the fuselage will mount with some pattern of holes depending on when we actually get that part made. I'll leave this blank for right now because when we make the other bulkhead that will attach to the wing, I'll at that point in time figure out where I want to have or if I want four holes, three holes, one hole, or oh, just let the wing sit there with a rubber band holding it in and the weight lift flies out and hits somebody in the head. Anyway, we did learn a significant amount from the first take apart plane that we, we originally envisioned only having two bolts. And when I put the whole plane together, and I saw how flimsy it was, I put a third bolt. And that seemed to work well. Now, because this plane doesn't have a motor in the front, we might, we might be able to get three or four bolts in here. Again, when it comes time to do that, I don't need, I don't need to cross that uh, the bridge until we come to it.
Now next step will be get this permanently installed and it will one step further down the road. Of course I want to make sure again most importantly that this is really right on the money. Getting this 90 degrees in both dimensions but most of all centered so that this former isn't cocked one way or another will make getting the one on the front of the wing a lot more accurate and lining up the nacelles because we're going to use this center line to line up the nacelles also. So if we, if we keep everything in alignment with that center line, I think we're safe in, in terms of getting the cells lined up. If that line starts to walk or vary, could be in trouble. Now, of course, I always would just run a tiny bead of CA down there, make sure it's accurate, recheck it with my 90 degree triangles. Then I'll hold it up and walk a bead right down both sides. Normally this would be going on a piece that has plywood. What I'm going to do is make up some quarter inch triangle gusseting here just so I enlarge the footprint that this that I only need it on this side of course just to give this a bigger footprint to glue to. I set the stripper to decided to make this piece out of three eighths by the way. I can strip off a couple of pieces. Now I want to cut a little bit of the material away here. So in effect it's like a fillet, similar to a fillet. Again, because this is not going on to a plywood doubler, this will just give it a wider footprint. one of these polywogs with a reverse curve I can just do a little bit of the sanding before I put it in place and then I can make a little dowel or a little handle to get in there and make a nice radius. A radius would probably be the strongest strength to weight ratio for this shape for any fillet anyway. It's easy just to get some thick CA. I just got a number twenty six handle. Conveniently enough, happens to fit that radius. by soaking that inside with thin CA, I think we'll get a really good bond on that. Making up the back piece, again, I made a balsa pattern, but I made it oversized. See, that won't fit in there yet. And then I take the same piece up here, because whenever, whenever a former tapers forward or back, you got to take into account how much of a taper it's going to have. So right here what I can do 
I know the bottom is a little on the tight side. And I know this will be on that side. So what I can do, I can just calculate in that little bit of an angle with the two dots. And then if it's not right, just keep grinding away, grinding away at the hard spot until I get that fit right. But these will be the two pieces that are going to hold a wing to the fuselage. Well, let's just double check we didn't get carried away here. So if I grind them, I can do that on a belt sander. make it a tight fit leave the line on because if let me just show you what happened when I press that in place I can see oops it's spreading a fuselage well what I'll do is I'll just take now I'll take the line off with the line off I can get a real nice tight fit I need this to come down right at the back of the wing That can be glued in. And it's going to be exactly like a Miss Ashley or whatever, that it just ends at the control horn and then we'll dremel out as much as we need to get the horn to slide through there. The last thing I can do here, I can pull out this balsa former because it's just redundant and I can get the same kind of a little fillet around the back of that piece. So I'll have one in the front and one in the back. Anyway, I could just, the, the easy way to get these bulkheads out is just slice them right through the middle. And this will just be one less thing we need. We don't really need these. They did their job. They kept our alignment. Now we could just get rid of them. It'll allow us to get our fillet right in there. Just the same as we had up here. And that's that's just about as strong as that needs to be. Now we finally come upon the time when all our formers are in. They're all lined up. The little filleting is done on front and back. And I guess that's going to be the end of the session. I hear the boss upstairs. <clears throat> and usually when I hear her making supper, that's the end of our day. Maybe we'll see when we come back to this what the next step of this is going to be. This gives me a little time to think about it. It's like a, like a dinosaur skeleton or something, doesn't it? Anyway, up to this point, this has really been uh, a real, my brain feels like, uh, like I need a nap or something. Just keep dreaming of that day, and at that first day that we're down in uh, the flying field, and the motors are running and they're idling with the Z-Tron and everything. Ah, oh, gee. And then you wonder why a day like today when you work all day and uh, it all becomes worthwhile at some point in time. Really does give me something to dream about. Here's the other point. It's such a more, an important time management point. While clear is drying, of course, that's a significant thing. And we're going to put one or two more coats on this, but the majority of the clear sitting right up by a heating vent where it can cook away for a while. We got the control system done. The tail is probably going to need one or two more coats of clear sprayed on. I sprayed the last coat on, and it's looking real nice. And that will be ready to start working on the silver. We still don't have Mike, uh, and again, Mike's mom passed away, so... Mike never got to the point where he finished the inking and we could put the clear on that, but we can't do it anyway because we're running into a terrible problem here. And the problem is we have lousy, lousy weather. We just have really not had any good weather. Anyway, we'll come back to this tomorrow and live to fight another day.
minutes here. I got about a half an hour, in fact. But what I want to do, the two things I can do is I can get this little spine part. See, if we try to carve blocks with this piece like this, you know it's going to break. So what I have is a piece of scrap. I was thinking about doing this, how I wanted to do it. I can just make a fake piece. Actually, this is almost going to fit. Whoa. Have I gone to church or what? Look at this. I know you're thinking, ah, oh, he planned it that way. No, I didn't. Anyway, this piece is only going to be in here temporarily so that I can't squeeze it while I'm carving away. And then if I have a little more time, then I'm going to go through my blocks. The lightest block is going to go at the back, the heaviest one at the front. You notice this has a little bit of a, a taper in the back. So what I want to do is... I measured the front up. The front is perfect, by the way. Fits just like it should, like I planned it this way. And I'm out about an eighth of an inch in the back, so I can pretty much figure out that taper and just take that little bit off on the belt sander. And what that'll give me is a nice tight fit here. It'll give me something to hold while we're doing the carbon. See what I went to put that in there? There's a hard spot right there, this side curves and then there's a hard spot so I'm just going to take just enough off because when this is put in let me just show it on see I don't want to have that spread like that I want to maintain that nice contour I guess what I can do here is just give me a little reference line to work with like I said I'm going to buy a pen that writes And just one by one, just take one line amount off at a time till it's a nice tight fit. I want to take off. It really will give me a, a good handle. Otherwise, I'm sure my bodybuilder that I am, my hands would go right through there. So that, and that obviously is going to come out when we take that piece out. Now what I want to do is just get some scrap sheeting, any thickness, anything I have in scrap, and just sheet this with the grain going side to side. And that, that whole piece eventually is going to be a scrap piece, so it does not have to be real accurate, but what has to be real accurate is when you look at it like this, that you've got the curve, and of course we're working off the top view. And that's about where it is. And we're about that much thinner than, about an eighth of an inch, a little more than an eighth of an inch of Dave's original drawing, and of course that front piece will be a separate block. Now we have to go through the blocks again. I marked them all, but I really want to get very, very concerned that the back of this plane be as light as possible because we know we're going to have a CG anomaly here to deal with and the block that goes in the front here around and those I don't need to use up my best block I can use the best one I have though behind the wing and this is real easy to figure out what the dimension that we need is just connect the two dots and fill us in but I want the grain going side to side now just one more little step we got out of the way tonight Next thing is going to be the blocks, but we have too many festivities going on around here, family things, so for now, anytime I can do one more little detail like that, that'll just help me in carving up the blocks. Now it's, it's Christmas Day, and I always, as I always do, I shoot video of the family, opening their presents and our friends that come over and everything, but this year we had something just a little bit different happen. And I'm going to put about two minutes of this video on, but this was the only Christmas in my whole life <clears throat> that I ever had anything like this happen. Of course, I'm taking pictures of the, the uh, Lionel train under the tree and Karen's nice decorative table and dreaming about the B-25 and going up to Johnny Duncan's a couple days after Christmas, having Elliot's visit. We had a lot of stuff going on here. It was a great time taking pictures all through the house of because each year we like to preserve just what the quality of our life was around that holiday time. We just bought a uh, 
a house real near ours, and so we were sharing gifts, and they're going to share the meal together. And Karen had spent about the last five days cooking this tremendous meal, setting a beautiful table, and we're praying. We have a whole bunch of people over here for Christmas Day. House is full of people. Guess as you can see from this, that the uh, the house was on fire. We had a house fire. Actually, what happened is the the food in the oven had caught fire. We had to have the fire department here. They came in with these fire extinguishers and pretty much made a mess you couldn't believe. But it was a it was a memorable Christmas, and we recovered from it. And what we had to do is we had to send out after Karen spent uh, five days cooking. We had to send out to the one Jewish deli in the neighborhood that had cold cuts for sale that day. So instead of the usual, we had salami and roast beef for Christmas dinner. It was a memorable one, and uh, we're going to get ready to go up to John Duncan's in the next day. We had a day in between, and uh, hey, we just wanted you to know we had a great Christmas. We're all alive and well, and uh, <laughs> that kitchen is a mess. Actually, we have to. Ju the only thing is we have to buy a new stove. The the stove was destroyed. When the firemen put the fire out, it, they said, just don't even turn it on again. What a mess. So we're going to take a little break from this. We've worked on getting some of our blocks ready, but basically the main thing we, we need to do next, we need to make a trip up, and it's about a two and a half, three hour ride up to John Duncan's workshop. He's going to uh, be cutting us the foam wings, the cores for this project, and we'd like to visit him. And this will be the first time we've ever shown his shop on video. This is his new house, his new shop, and we're going to do that today. Always get feedback from people that one of the things they like about the videos the most is that they can visit other people's shops. I mean, how many people get to visit worldwide? And uh, we're hoping we're going to get some video from England even soon. Elliot has a brand new shop. It's just, it's always exciting to me to see how other people set up their shops. I always wind up getting some good ideas. And John Duncan is definitely one of our favorite people. And Joe, this guy's got a brand new shop too. We hope he's visiting him soon. Now on the way up to John's, it is just, just absolutely a beautiful ride. It's about a three hour ride from where we are. No leaves on the trees, no snow yet. And when we used to come up here for the Coxsackie contest a couple of times a year, it was always, and Karen loves it up here. She didn't come for the trip today. She loves, this is the antique center of the world up here. This is the most important thing in John's shop. The, uh, the, <laughs> the propane heater. What is this? Gas or kerosene? Kerosene, oh. And you can see he uses it to dry up his foam blocks. And we're in, this was a garage at one time. And this is where John runs his business out of. And when he's not looking, when he goes for pizza later, we're going to steal all his good. <laughs> I bet he's got it hidden somewhere other than the shop. <laughs> that all his templating for the foam wings here. How many wings do you have templates for, you think? Oh, God. It's a thousand? It's yeah. 25, 30. Yeah, there's a lot, I know. And we're sad to report we don't know where Scott Smith is. He's out bicycle riding or something. <laughs> anyway, we're going to try to uh, cut some foam wings for the B-25 today. And we've got Dave's plan laid out. We're making up some, some upper view templating blocks right now. We'll try to go through a couple minutes of what it takes to be, holy mackerel, he's got speed boats here and everything. Quite a nice shop, John. You need a few more sets of plans, I think. <laughs> How's Marlene adapting to this idea that you never, uh, she never gets to put the car in a garage anymore? <laughs> Lose the car. Up some templates for the top two sections of the foam, and the first thing he's going to do is cut out the blocks. About a giant. This is a one-third scale SIG Spacewalker. 
and this is a one-third scale. What what kind of dog is this? This skinny ass thing. <laughs> hey, you skinny thing! I wish I was that skinny. <laughs> it's quite a plane. Yeah, it's my neighbor's Gary's. Oh, okay. He's cleaning out his basement, and I was gonna buy it, but it's just too big. I have one of these Macaulay props that I when I had my air coupe, I had almost this. You got the same tip design that I had. <laughs> <laughs> the the cur curled up tip. You have to be a real air coupe pilot to do tips like that. And you got your old Johnny. I don't know what we should call him, the Johnny, <laughs> the Johnson stunt. <laughs> and foam blocks. Our favorite foam blocks. Do you find a place up here to buy foam? Can without run down in my area? Or? Uh, John's laying it out on a rough block. We, we're going to be adding our secret calculation to how much we have to add for the dihedral break because we're going to have to grind some off and of course I want to have the full span. I want to lose an inch in a span when I make the angle cuts for the dihedral break. So ma master technician here knows exactly how much that is because he cuts thousands of wings per day. He knows exactly how much to add. Anyway, we can always shave a little off if it doesn't match the print. You know, it's funny, a lot of people, uh, when they see a foam wing cut the first time, they think it come, the blocks come cut the size of a wing and you just cut, you know, they have no clue. It's like a tree. If you hand somebody a tree and they want 16 sheet, you know? <laughs> the hard part is getting it down to 16 sheet. This is the hard part. Okay, you got it. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be adding even enough that, that we're never going to have to worry about all those dihedral breaks. In case I get them wrong six times in a row. <laughs> and that that was our master plan, is to cut two sets of wing cores in case in, <coughs> in case I cut a little too much off one. Well, I'll tell you, even though it's freezing cold outside, it's not cold in this garage. You got good insulation here. No, I had that thing on since 8 o'clock this morning. Right? Oh, you're trying to impress me. <laughs> Yeah, there were days we cut wings over in Georgie's shop. It was so cold you couldn't touch the bow. He wouldn't leave the heat on overnight just because we were cutting foam. <laughs> I don't know, but we painted my Vulcan here. Like, oh, geez, now the truth comes out. We're out of fuel and holy Toledo. Yeah. Cold in here. <laughs> it gets cold quick when you don't have any. Oh, yeah. Now you know why, you know, they say people that live in cold water climates are more aggressive than people that live in warm weather climates. There's a reason. You start freezing, you go over and choke the neighbor and get the logs out of his fireplace. <laughs> Grab his balsa wood pile and throw it on. Oh, oh God, you're right, Wendy. It's true. Johnny, you're going to paint... Paint the airy the mark? I don't know. Oh, I love that smell of that formaldehyde gas. Breathe deep. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that ventilation to a minimum. <laughs> Is it, is, is well, it's not as bad. Well, you can see how much overage we've left for the dihedral breaks and for the fact that we changed the front of the wing from 3-8 to quarter inch. Well, I'll have to find out more detail, but everybody's all right. I don't know. Yeah, just John is one of the few people I know has a car in his workshop. He's got a... What is that, a Spitfire, a Triumph? 72 Spitfire, yeah. Triumph. And how many you got? You There's one in the driveway, too. One in the driveway, one in here, and one underneath the deck. That's the part. <laughs> so you're really a Spitfire parts man here. Anybody out there need parts? I you probably have it for sale. And Glenn Keller trying to convince his wife he's not doing something illegal or immoral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She checks up on you. She knows you're in that go-go bar, huh? <laughs> was one of the tools. Is this the one Scotty had? Yes. This is Scotty's? He had, Scotty's had pins. Mine didn't have pins. That, that was solid uh, nylon. 
and Midgley had machined a straight edge and what you do you sandwich in six eight how many sheets can you cut at one time oh probably about five six sheets five or six I've used to do with mine and then just you could trim them off with an exact 90 degree edge and when you made this the ring skins which we've already done of course already got the skins done but you could really get a nice edge on that and that oh, was okay. from Dave Midgley who I don't think he well, makes them anymore but he, he was making them for a while yeah Okay, well, uh, let's see a little. Now, before you ever even put a template to the foam, there's an awful lot of cutting and trimming to be done, and John is doing all that. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. First for Dawn. <laughs> Thanks, Dawn. <laughs> Send a card instead. You want to drop the breath? Oh, all right, thanks. The thing I the thing I remember, even when Scotty was doing them down in his house, is people think the block of foam comes all cut. You lay the template on each edge, do one cut, and you're done. Yeah. They have no idea how much work is involved in this. Now John is just finishing up truing up the block, which you have to do for each individual wing, and these are no different. That's for sure. That's the final slice. Now that's the block, and it's in. When it's cut in half, it'll be both halves of the outer panel of the wing. That's done? The last cut's done on that one? Yep. Okay. The walk-around phone. <laughs> you are really a high-tech guy. This is a high-tech shop one. Yeah. I get I'm, a, I'm a, you've I'm got all the secrets phone. of success going here. Yeah, I got it on my head now. <laughs> I don't have three Spitfire cars in my garage, though. <laughs> you, you have them hanging in your bedroom, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, Mine aren't rusting away in the garage. One's outside the front and one's underneath the deck. Now what he's going to do here is he's got, I got three aluminum things. things that you're going to cut that block so that he originally trued up. For fire safety. And cut it right in, <laughs> right in half. Oh, Hummel's on the phone now. Oh my God. Hummel's checking up on us. The fire inspector's on the phone. Hummel the hero. Tell him I found two more pieces of wood for him, too. Found two more pieces of wood for him. Give him the Glenn. Glenn will take him. You might not get the same four pieces with you. <laughs> yeah, you certainly won't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I I don't know if I trust this guy with anything but cold coffee here. <laughs> These guys are tough. <laughs> when you want to play in a big city, you gotta pay, baby. Hey, here's Wendy. Let's see if I can get the other phone on. Hey, you want to show? You got these custom high-tech nails that go into the templates. Home Depot specials. We're gonna find out if Wendy's metal insert template. John says they won't work. He, he knows they're not going to work. But we can make templates. It's not a problem. We'll see how they work. Anyway, we made these on with the little wire insert. Did you ever have them with the wire insert? No, I never tried that. Okay. Well, you can see I gave you a copy of the video so you can see how I did it. That was old from old technology from years ago. And it's real good if you're cutting a wing where you're going to make 50 copies of them at you know what I mean? The, they'll all be exactly the same. Where the wood starts to get little dings in it, and and we still need to find out if we're gonna be, if this is gonna be too thin. Dave Downey thinks that's well. We're gonna find out, and I can add. So actually, I already add some in there right now, but that piece gets cut away with the bell crank anyway. So we'll find out. Well, you don't have to wax them. Oh. oh okay. We're gonna see if John John's doing a little practice run up here on the uh, the turbo cat or whatever this is. <laughs> We're going to see if Wendy's templates are going to melt or be able to make a wing with them. Got to get that timing down, John. It's all in the timing. Now he's doing a practice. The idea is that you, that you start, one side is bigger than the other, so you start and you, you go into the foam and wind up coming out of the foam at exactly the same time. And of course, of course, he hasn't cut this panel yet. This is, this is cut one. Well, let's see if one of these templates make a wing or they make scrap foam. Or insulation in my attic. <laughs> Insulation in my attic. I like your I like your attitude. Very okay. smooth. I like the wire. You like the wire? It's not hard to make it. You'll see it's on the first video how I did that. It's not a big deal at all. What I'm worried about is if that the inner one is gonna be too big. We're certainly gonna find out. Now what? 
what happens is he reverses the template to cut the other side so that both sides are cut totally identically. There's a gas that comes off when you do cut with a hot wire so you, he's got a nice little ventilation fan going here. Now even the bottom cut you're gonna, you feeling that, that that's pretty smooth on the wire? Beautiful. So maybe we did make some progress. It's not a big deal to put that, you know, and you don't need thick wire. A, a 30 second is plenty. You know, because you're already catching it on the really on the end. He's got the bow hung up here. Gee, Scott, or Johnny, you did a good job. <laughs> Oh, we'll know in a second. We'll know. Oh my God! Look at the cut he's got! <laughs> oh, oh man, you better kiss Wendy's ass today. <laughs> that looks great. Let's go oh, over by the plane and let's see if we cut a biplane here or what. Let's go. Oh, he cut the wrong saw, oh, John. Let's let's see how close it is to the drawing. Now we made it a little over because we have to cut the dihedral angle in. But from Dave Downey's unbelievably good drawings. John, you're in, baby. John, you're I don't even think you have to sand that one. Boy, that's about as good as it gets. That is I like that wire. Say that again. I like that wire. I like that wire. <laughs> See, you give all the monkeys all the wire in the world and you get good templates. Look at this, he's got a Spitfire kit here. Woo -hoo. All right, so we're in. You feel uncomfortable with that? Yeah. I think that's gonna work. Now this one's a little bit different because of a trailing edge sweep. Normally you have a, a straight line and one hand's... Yeah, this is actually a little bit a, a little bit awkward for you, huh? A little bit. It's not... But those wires make it all worthwhile, huh? <laughs> Boy, do I rub it in a lot. <laughs> Scotty, where are you now that we need you? All right. Foot pedal, it heats the wire. When he steps on that, the power goes to the wire. The wire gets cherry red hot. He's got little things that go around the wire, like dowels that hold it. And we all get to breathe that great formaldehyde dust. You know what, Johnny? What? How's Busso doing? Jeez, uh, I haven't seen or heard from him. He was into fishing the last time I saw him. He came up in to, to Midgley's contest yeah. there and flew to Red Plain. Was having a great time. And uh, then he went took his fishing, oh, his golf clubs or fishing pole. I don't know what he had fish with uh, the guy that has the maple syrup factory. I think those templates are just as good as if you laser cut them out of 16 steel or something. And they're, boy, they're a whole lot cheaper. Even if Jimmy did it, there'd still be money setting up the machine. Acceptable. Does that meet the rigid standards of uh, <laughs> John the Pizza Man here or what? Yep. Okay. Macho, baby. I am totally impressed. Okay. Dave Downey is probably getting ready to throw a tomato at my videos. <laughs> <laughs> critical stunt person in the whole world. Probably. He's critical of, of the taste of the hot dogs at the circle burner people. <laughs> Everything is a problem for Glenn. Oh man, Glenn. Well, you're here witnessing stunt history, Glenn. Yep. You go out on the internet tonight, you report to these guys, I saw the B-25 wing getting cut. And it looks terrible. Does that one look okay? Uh, just... Oh, oh, he's not just a uh, Just... Wing tip. The uh, outer panel. Oh, I like the way this man works. I'm telling you. Uh, should we, can Brett call it in? 
Or do, or do you want me to yeah, call? Yeah, I can call it. Yeah. yeah. We'll go get it. Where, where is Glenn's it? Glenn's going to run and get us a big pepperoni pie to speed up the construction of this B-25. I've got to go all the way to who's it falls for it now? No, nah, it's right down here. Cambridge? It's right down the corner. Get down here, out of driving, go straight <laughs> They can love Didn't thing. you ever buy a pizza pie in your life? What, what kind of neighborhood oh. did you grow up in? <laughs> God. Oh. Glenn, we're all hungry. Oh. Tell, tell Brett, get on words, the stick. In other words, get going, right? Get on the, get on the stick, man. Now, what size did you want, Joe? That size right there. This size. There's only one size, windy size. The biggest with the most calories. Here we go. B25 outer panel number one coming up. With the templates, look at that cut he's getting in the phone. John, I am amazed. I am totally, totally impressed. Yeah, I'd never move to a town that didn't have a good pizza place. It's the law. He's doing the bottom cut here. Now I'll be able to go lay that over on the uh, the plan and see how accurate it is. Woo! -hoo. These look just about as, as close to being right as you possibly could ever want. We're going to just go ahead and cut the second set. You actually save, like when you do the second and third cuts, you get you get a little rhythm going? A little bit. I mean, you get some, I know that. Where it just, everything just falls into place better. I know it goes better you have a slice of pepperoni pizza. That's That, that adds about 10% to my production for the day. That low calorie pepperoni pizza. You know, I even have the bird eating that That's pizza a now. Contradiction of terms. Peeps, Peeps eats that pepperoni all the time. Peeps does? Yep. Is he still in your cellar? Yep, yep, he likes it there. Oh, he he needs a woman now. He knows a good thing. The only thing missing in his life is, is a female Peeps. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not so sure he doesn't think I'm the female Peeps sometimes. <laughs> the two cut, and they are ready for coring. And we've checked them over the plan. There's, they're about as accurate as anything I've ever seen. Well, the next step on this is going to be to core them out. Now, a lot of people in the past, oh, you actually could do it now, do the sheeting first and then core it out. Well, if you do with epoxy, I think that's worthwhile. But when you do the method I use with the contact cement, I don't think you gain or lose anything that way. Again, we'll find out. And this is this is Scotty's coring jig. Yes, it is. Yep. It was originally Bob Hunt's or Jim Hunt's or. Sheet of masking tape. Yeah. Now, what John did, he marked out the coring locations from the templates. The bottom triangle is telling him where the bottom one would go. What that does puts a hole in it, so you gotta you can get the wire through for the inside cuts. <laughs> you gotta watch when you move into a neighborhood like this, John. Note that the pizza piles are too far away. That's that cuts into your mileage, you know, your shop time when you gotta go. <laughs> Although we'll probably get twice as much done with Glenn out at the pizza place. It just cleans all the goop off the wire. Yep. So she doesn't smoke as much. Yeah, I hear that. And you're going both ends to the middle. Do you have a miss? <laughs> Glad you admit it. We used to miss half at a time. Actually, it's a nice ride up here. It was not bad. I thought you guys had snow up here and everything. I was getting ready to. Karen says take the snow things and all that baloney. 
You have a thing for scraping snow off the car? It's like, you get the same weather we have down by us. We haven't had much snow at all, just a dusting. No, mitchell has got some up by him, but that's it. How's Dave doing? Doing good. In this wing's case, it's easier to do individual pieces than to do a whole, like if this wing was one piece with no dihedral. It is, you can go right through the center sections. Pretty cool. It's like doing a half of a wing panel, so. Yeah, yeah. the hole cut he can has his little trick thing to pull a wire through for each section. Now this side there's no wire on on these these inside cuts so we don't have any illusions that these are going to be perfect. They don't have to be you don't see these. And we could always run a if we were really crazy run a vacuum cleaner in there and pull out a little bit anyway. Not a trick. How do you get that off the wire? Watch this magic trick. <laughs> what a guy. I would have never thought of that. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's what separates the Scotties from the no Scotties. All right. What a guy. And, uh, you only got to do this 12 times and we'll be ready for pizza. But if Kayla doesn't get lost, uh, mug down there at the pizza place. <laughs> Can you trust him alone to, to drive uh, without a map or whatever? I mean, he's six miles from home, you know, he could get lost. <laughs> we should have tied a string to him so he didn't get lost on the way down. He's got my 20 bucks, too. They'll probably stop the go-go place. That'll be the end of our pizza pie. Oh. Success go to our head, do we? Yeah. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. What a guy. It's only fair to say how many hours Dave Downey worked on getting this dihedral angle right, and it was a labor of love. Boy, that's a lot of work getting that right. Anyway, he does have it right, and he's got it laid up. If you see everything. It shows the scale wing, where the actual scale wing is, and then where the stunt wing is, just for comparison purposes. And where it's going to be, uh, once we get the wing sheeted, getting all the dihedral brakes, getting the controls in there, and then of course hoping Warren Walker has our control system done by the time we're done with this. Well, that's the challenge. The challenge of getting a decent pizza in Upper New York State. <laughs> You send Kayla out, Kayla goes out, but he doesn't come back. <laughs> How long's Kayla been gone? God, he's been gone like three hours to get this pizza pie. It better not be cold when he gets here, too. 
Where the hell did you go to Rutherford to get this pie? Peeps made this pie for you. I told him to bring it down here and he walked upstairs and I should change. Oh, thank you. What a guy. Glenn, let's eat, man. Johnny's doing slam dunking these wings in. He's got one There's cord out already. Slam dunking wings. Slam dunking wings. Dunk dunk. That'd be a great name for your business. Slam dunking wings. Johnny, it's nothing supersedes the need for pizza. Put the wings away. Get the pie out. Now we have one complete set. John starting on the second complete set. And we hope at the end of this session we'll have two complete sets, cord, ready for sheeting. Well, the ride home from John's is, as always, uneventful. After a, a whole day at John Duncan's, what Elliot did is he brought back a whole bunch of motors, and we're going to look at the possibilities here. What is that, the Max? Well, that's the little Irvin that George did? The uh, Irvin 36 modified the George Aldrich one. Okay, around. that's George's. We got Irvins that are stock, and they're probably too heavy and too powerful. A little OS Max 32F. Keep in mind that this placement can't be more than 3.6. So we thought if we would just to look at all the possibilities and certainly the one of the possibilities is if you had two 35s you don't have any 35s to check though do you these are 40s yeah, yeah that's a 40 mm -hmm. and of course if this if necessary we're just going to put the sados in there and be done with it <laughs> but this is we're looking to save about roughly 10 ounces over what the sados would be but again you never really know it unless you do the check the test the little oven was 10 yeah, it's 10 with the carburetor. That's heavy. That's a shame that that's a heavy engine. Mm -hmm. The Max is an ounce lighter, and Randy's little Aero Tiger is the lightest. Mm -hmm. So it's, in almost every way that we're looking at this, it's it's looking like maybe the Aero Tiger is going to be the uh, the ultimate lightweight winner, assuming we can get another one. We only have one. Okay. Let's see if that carburetor fits in the Aero Tiger. That little carburetor? Yeah, sure. There's some surprising things that I didn't realize, and that's the weight of these. That little Irvin carburetor is the heaviest one of them all, it's by far. I mean, you don't even need a scale to. I wonder if the little Sato could. Do you ever weigh a Sato carburetor? No. We need I'm to sure look if, at. If you're looking to get weight down, I'm sure we can just find a lighter car. I wonder if you can. Yeah. I wonder if I can't come up with something like a. Uh, since I'm, you know, well, I don't know what the choice of, we have so many choices here, but the Tiger carb is just as heavy, wow, it's made it probably even heavier than the Max carb, and since we're going to be using carburetors, that's one of the things that makes a project like this very complicated, but we're going to work on it. That's I'm one of the... The 36s might be a little heavy, but they run beautifully. Yeah, well, tomorrow we'll take one out of the box. You got one that we can run. Is George's ready to run? Yeah, you just bolt it back together, it'll run, yeah. Uh, Elliot brought this over for my wait, Christmas wait. present. Notice that this is I don't know, I think it's just a, little notes, uh, a wall mural of the uh, Typhoon plans. And remember the old magazines where they used to have cutaways and show the ribs and the bolts holding the tail and the Typhoon front? Well, we hope we're going to have one of these a year or two from now for the B-25 and we may even we may even make this a uh, boy that is nice. Did a great job, Bill. Fantastic, and of course the plans right there. Now we got to find a place of honor to put that. That's alongside all our Irvine engines, and but well, we have got enough engines here to choke. Enya, what does Enya make? A thirty-five? Oh, do they make a thirteen <laughs> or twenty-five? Well, it makes me crazy. We've got a thousand dollars red engine, and, and we're. We're probably going to settle on Fox 35 before yeah, the day's over. Yeah, Fox 35 in a little snack? No, we're going to Steve's for well, supper. No, wait, actually, it's going to be quite a while because we have to wait for Craig to come pick up the car. Okay, we'll wait for Craig. Well, Elliot, that's wonderful. we got to find a place to hang it.
that, come on, tell me the truth, how did that lettering come out? Oh, All right. Uh, so oh, we don't care about your inking job. But when it clears on there, you'll never see it. What do you think, Richard? We're giving Jack a bone a hard time about building his wheel pants for his stoop here. Oh, come on, Mike, that lettering looks fine. That looks really good. Now, what do we got to do? Figure out how to make a cowling here, huh? Yeah, I've made two, two, three, and I'm at a word. Okay, flip it over. Let's see what we could do about making up. We don't know if we're going to be able to do this or not. This one looks like it's pretty good. Oh, you put plywood on it. Okay. Let's see if this is going to work. It's nice. Well, you know it's going to be higher than you need. You know that because we made that for the four-stroke. Right. But I was thinking maybe we could grind it down. Quick thing here we're going to do to Mike. We cut the top piece off, and we're going to trace this even with, because this is a cowl for a four-stroke, it's much higher, even with the lip, and grind this on a belt sander even. Mike will get that even. And then we'll cut a piece of plywood. We'll see. But I And you could put the hole for the glow plug and some vent holes and everything. But then he can use his original cowling mounts, too. So having that little mold for the cat, and of course, you just can sand that in. That's no problem at all. That'll save uh, quite a bit of work not having to carve that cowling up. It's a plywood top for that. Because we had to cut the top off. <laughs> We're going to use the original mounting holes. You got the objective here is that the bolts are already in position holding this flat. This is a little oversized, and now we can just grind and sand that off. Cut the holes for the motor. And what do you think, baby? We're in, kid. You're in. In only an hour. Why don't you just, yeah, why don't you just go home and carve a block from a... No more, no more. <laughs> All right, what a guy. That'll be a good fun. little tip on the B-25 videos. <laughs> the last step here, while our pizza's being delivered, and I love these shop building days where... <laughs> get about nine things done at once here. Tom Hampshire is supposed to join us to work on some of these Irvine motors. Give us some clues. Once you get the last boy out there, what are we working on? It's a couple hours? An hour? And you got another cowling and boy. That's it baby. You're in. Once that's all put together again, It'll only be a couple days. We'll be ready for the clear on this. Ready for we'll be ready to fly. Ready for more clear on Miss Ashley. We're dying to get the rest of the clear, but of course it's ten below zero out there now. Fuselage is framed up. Wings are cut. The hats are ready. I don't know how to could get a whole lot better than this. Miss Jamie's ready. Miss Ashley's ready, and Miss B25 is going to be ready soon. Even Peeps is ready for that pizza. Where's Peeps? Hey, tricky. Pizza's on its way. The pizza delivery boys are on their way. Work for you? Yeah. I'll be fine. Ah, I like it. Now, we're so glad we made that mold, aren't we? Oh, yeah. I can yeah. hear him saying now, Wendy. Thank you, Uncle Wendy. That's going to work fine. More sanding here. Maybe open it. Make sure you can get your finger in there, even though it looks right. Oh, you I got the little, up a little more, I won't. You got the gap, the little gap for the header. Yeah, that'll work. That's got the real cardinal look, too. Looks good. Um, Elliot made some concept drawings here for some of his future projects. He's been sketching away like a wild man. Oh, I like the one that looks like a... Uh, the Chinese plane with the radial engine. Open cockpit. Some more concept drawings. Okay. What I love about group building session days and repair days is having Karen bring us down the uh, mandatory pot of coffee, which she's been gracious enough to do. And while we have our pizza delivery boys still out delivering pizza. God, where did those guys go? To the go-go place? I hope they didn't go to England. But I think they went to England to get us pizza pie. It's going to look good, Mikey. Yeah. I'm telling you, you're okay. I don't care what Peabody says about you. And our new addition to our... I really like that. That's really, that was a really nice gift, personalized gift. That actually looked good in stunt news. With the cutaways and everything. And, of course, the Typhoon plans. And we're going to obviously have exactly the same thing this time next year or a year later for the B-25.
every Sunday. Is this the Pizza Jack of Bones pizza delivery? <laughs> what the hell's going on? I could have built another plane. I could have built another Strago by the time you guys. We couldn't find the place. Oh, man. Tom, you believe this? No. 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 Oh. We got donuts. And uh, Burger King. Yeah, you Burger gave him. You bird. gave him what? You know, if he could, if he could say that with a little straighter face, it might. <laughs> it might fly. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't gonna fly while I'm around. That, Bring that pizza. That dog won't hunt. No, that dog do not hunt. Come on, pizza boy. Peeps wants to come out of the cage. <laughs> this is the secret. This is the secret to having long a long life expectancy. Oh, what a nightmare. And these guys are designing up motor technology this here. here is but this is donut technology. Where's the, the skirt clearance. You fly away? Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's just to make sure Give some pepperoni. Before I cut anything okay. that I don't drop the That's sleeve. That's the key so that I wouldn't interrupt this video, except I think this is really an amazing thing. We took Elliot down here when he was by. This is a house that uh, apparently the man has a lot of free time. And check, I don't know what the, what the world's record is for the most lights on a house, but... He even has lights on the car that's in the driveway, if you'll look at it real close. There's a car in the driveway that has lights. <laughs> it's a pretty amazing thing. Now we're coming up on New Year's. Who knows what's going to happen. Elliot's on his way back to England, and we're going to get back to working on that B-25. Just thought you'd enjoy. And by the way, we still have Warren Walker's Christmas tree in front of our house. It didn't blow away yet, but we don't have this many lights. Trust me, this is the B-25 of houses. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed that house. That was pretty special. Anyway, today one of our goals is we want to try to get the wing sheeted. Now, over the years, I've made a lot of foam wings um, using a lot of different methods of attaching the wing skins, and that's what we're going to try to do today is attach the wing skins, but I've not found a better way than the, than the method I'm going to show. We've won the concourse twice using this method. And that's one of the things I think that, that a lot of people have a misconception. If a plane has a foam wing, it's, it's in some way handicapped weight-wise or, or whatever. But I don't think that's true. I think a foam wing plane can be just as competitive, just as beautiful. It can certainly win the Nats, certainly win the concourse, certainly win the World Championship. So... Given all that, it speaks loudly. Oh, and we made a video with Scott Smith. It's still available. As, and it goes for about six hours, I think, of how Scotty used epoxy to join his wing skins to the foam cores. Well, the method I'm showing is the same as on the foam wing video that we've used years ago, used for many years. I think this is this is my first choice as a way to do it. Jim Greenaway was, of course, the one that taught me all of the uh, the technology that I used to do the foam wings, the glassing technology, and actually he used to cut all the wings. And we had some pretty successful planes over the years. Now, if you go back to some of the old videos, the sidewinders and some of the original Cardinal foam wing videos, the one that we use as a foam wing video set. We're going to be replacing that with this tape in the near future. So a lot of this footage is going to wind up on what I hope is going to be an all new 2001-2002 video on foam wing construction with a lot of the updates. Well, just, just keep in mind, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but this is the way, using the 3M spray cement, this is the way that's worked best for me. We have videos on making carbon wings, I-beam wings, D-tube wings, C-tube wings. And now this plane, because of the additional features of having dihedral and several other unique features that are unique to the B-25, this is just going to be just a little more complex. But it's the same rules. The same rules apply to this as, as to if you were doing a, a, a totally straight wing traditional stunner. Just before we go any further, if, if you're interested in the epoxy method or some of the other methods, we do have those on video. Scott Smith used those very successfully. But this is the method that I prefer. Now, if you notice, the first, the first thing when you buy some of this cement, because it comes in little cans, but you need a big can to do a wing. I do anyway. 
the number Super 77 sometimes when you buy it the can will be exactly the same these cans used to be blue you'd buy it and it'd be a little you almost couldn't see it an N and it would melt the foam so the first thing I did years ago is I called up 3M and said what gives well they make this formula of glue for a thousand different purposes it's used for everything art supply uh, different different applications they use the same basic formula with with some minor changes but every once in a while I would get a can that didn't have the N and I'd go spray some foam and it would melt the foam and I'd say ah and I'd realize that they had changed the formula so what you have to do the first thing is get a can of glue and test it on some foam and the way you test it is you take a piece of the scrap foam and spray a big glob of it on and see if it melts if it does if it melts the foam you can't go any further till you get the right glue this is a critical step not to leave out and you can buy the same glue in art supply stores that has a different number a slightly different number you can buy it in home depot sometimes it'll have the end sometimes it doesn't and i really don't it's a confusing thing but once you get the right can and in this case what i did I bought a can that worked and I went and bought right away from that supply went and bought three or four more cans you can see I bought the store out in fact because what I wanted to make sure is I had it all from the same batch the thing I do is I do want to do my test just to make sure even though I've done this test before I want to make sure and because I can't go outside today it is absolutely freezing out there it's it's probably about 12 degrees and the wind is howling so I set up a part of the shop you could lay an old bed sheet down and, and just throw it out because wherever you're going to spray this contact cement some of it ultimately winds up on a floor and if you don't do this and, and of course the way I know this is I'd spray this without newspaper on the floor sometimes and by the end of the third skin I'd be I'd be like spider-man walking on the floor like suction cup feet anyway the first thing is to do a little test I glue when I'm when I'm working in a project like this up by a heating vent it, you don't want to make it red hot but on the other case it's about 60 degrees in our shop here it's cold I don't want the glue to freeze and the other thing I don't want to have happen I don't want it to all settle to the bottom so shake shake just like mixing epoxy shake the glue some of the requirements here it is freezing in here by the way it it's about 61 degrees but shaking the glue very very important keeping the tip clean when you're done spraying it's a good idea to pick I don't know if you can see all the little glue off here it sounds like this is real complicated but it isn't this is the this is the easiest way I know and in times Scott and I would do the test together and the weight would be very similar except in his case it took a lot more time now I don't want to make this soaking wet but I want to get a light let me spray out See, this tip is clogged from the last time we used it. This is why it's nice to have 10 things of... Oh, cool. Let me show you. And I go get a pin, clean all this garbage off, or else just go get another can if this tip is, is unacceptable. But this is what happens when you don't do a good job of cleaning it. And what I did, I got one of the bigger cans. That, that tip was almost impossible to clean up just because I wanted to have a new tip. But I noticed they give you, in the bigger cans, they give you a spare tip, which might have a different spray pattern or something. But the white tip, I've always had reasonably good luck with. Anyway, I want to do a little spray test. And I want to, as, just as if I was doing a foam wing. Of course, this side of the core I don't use, so we'll find out. Now, the way you know if you have the right amount of glue on this, and it's not exactly like a spray, is I pick it up, and let me see if I can do this, if I can candle it, that you just see just the slightest bit shiny. The other test is you wait a minute and you can just feel it get like flypaper. We'll give that a minute. But it should not in any case attack the foam. If it attacks the foam, then you know you're in trouble. This is a test. Remember the same thing. I want to do the wood the same way. Just a piece of scrap wood. I want to look at it, kind of candle it. It should just be this, sl and it's a good idea to practice with this. Now, because it's real cold in here, this is going to take four or five minutes. Normally, if we were outside, see here it goes. See how it turns into flypaper? 
You can accelerate this by heat, the temperature in the shop, and this is why it's a good idea, even if this is, if you've done a hundred foam, here it goes. If you've done a hundred foam wings already, it doesn't matter. It's a good idea to just give it some time, and a little practice never hurt. Now, this will help. This will accelerate it, and let's see if we're getting, see how it's getting sticky already? Now, the thing is, when we do a real wing, we only get one shot to put this wood down. We only get one time. And if we put it crooked and we miss a corner and whatever, you don't get to do it over again. So we're going to lay this all out carefully with, ink, with an ink marker or with a pen or whatever. But then you can do a little test in the corner. And that's going to take a minute or so more because it's so cold in here. If this were a hot day, this would already be done. It's good to get a feel for just how long this takes to get sticky. It's getting sticky at a very slow rate here for two reasons. Number one is it's so cold. Later on in the day, when it warms up, now see you can see we've got a bond already. Now I could still peel that off so I know it's not ready to go. When that gets on there the final time, there's no way you can pull it off. When you pull it off, and just getting this little technique down pat with practice, if you have some extra cores, some old cores, an old set of cores of something. This is just get a feel for just how sticky that becomes. Oh, there we go. Now you can't get it off. Now it's on there forever. There's, if you take this and it does go off, and you put two pieces of wood, you can do it with a piece of wood, but you don't know if the foam is going to. Now once that's on there, you can get a feel for just how strong that bond is. And, and the wood will come apart before you can get it out. Also, having a little bit on your fingertips like that, you got to constantly clean your fingertips with alcohol or M600 or something, or you wind up becoming a flypaper man. Okay, the test is done. We're ready to lay out the cores. Just use this side. I'll lay wax paper on this side when we actually use it. But knowing how sticky this can be, this really gets... That at some point in time, and depending on the temperature, this will get so sticky that once you, once you get your finger stuck to it, it'll take a piece, in fact it's already done it, it takes a piece of foam out with it rather than just to laminate. Now we know that's ready to assemble. And you have a window of about 15 minutes, probably 10-15 minutes later you could lay another, just like sanding blocks, it's a good idea to practice on sanding blocks, that same glue works on sanding blocks. But that gives you an idea how sticky that glue really is. With my little test, I'll take some office paper. I took that little piece of wood off with a knife with a brand new blade. I put office paper on it because then it that still keeps the core intact. I don't want to lose the core. I can just trim this off. Because ultimately we're not going to need the cores. Now if you were using epoxy, you really do need the cores. Using this method, the cores are less important. I don't want it, what I don't want to wind up with, I can put a piece of paper in the middle there, in fact. I just don't want to wind up with that in the middle of doing this, in the middle of working on this, if I do need this core, then I'm going to have a problem with it. It protects it, now I can lay it that way on the table and work on the wing. Now also, keep in mind, when John makes the wings, no matter what wing it is, it'll always have marked top right, top left, top right. Each core is unique to its individual pieces. So before I would do any work on this, one of the things I would do, get some colored ink markers, and in this case, I can mark this one goes with this one. Or whatever. If necessary, put two stripes on that side. So that you don't start using the right core with the right crit. Even though they're very accurate, Sometimes they could be off by half the thickness of a pencil line or whatever. It, this just makes it more reliable that you always put the same thing. In other words, when John cuts them, that piece never comes out. And then he marks it with a stamp. So you know, this is the top right wing, the top left wing. You don't flip-flop them or cross them. Very handy to have that information. Important step. I'm going to start this is to clean every little bit of junk off our table. Scrape the table down, clean it with acetone, because what will happen if even one little dot of this CA, this already cured CA gets underneath a wing skin, it puts a gouge in it. So cleaning the table 
super important right now is to start with a really nice look at it. in fact there's all little chunks coming off from the construction trick and back in the old in the old days the last couple of foam wings we made the cuts were a lot rougher than with these wire inset templates but it still pays to do a little bit of this and I got the real smooth sandpaper on here and what it's going to do is make dust Leave it right in the core. I'm not changing the shape. I'm just taking out the wire, this fuzz that comes when you cut it. Now, every step of the way, right up to the gluing process, what we're going to be doing is vacuuming this with a brush. Let me give you an example of what happens with this. Because this is all part of the preparation. I keep that I keep that right next to me. Now you can see what what you'd like to wind up with is the most surface area and the least amount of dust when you actually go and put the glue on. And there are a, a couple little baby little wire marks. None of these are significant. You're not looking to make a uh, you know a buffed out finish here, but the more surface area you can get the contact, the less to say, the better it'll be. And I'll spend a little bit of time. Just show this up close. You can see how it, it does smooth out a certain amount. Now the other thing is to get all of the wood edges before we actually start gluing to get the wood edges and everything cut and ready to go. Wing skins that I've made up previously from four inch sheets. Again, this is I think on tape one. But I've weighed each whole skin so that I can get the lightest ones on the inboard panel and the heaviest ones on the outboard panel. Needless to say, we made a couple extra ones, but I always look at it and I always mark. Now you can see on each one I've got written glue side because what I do, I run my hand down a seam and sometimes the seam just isn't perfect and it has a little ripple. And I don't want to sand them paper thin. I mean, I want, this is, this is going to be a a pretty heavy duty piece of construction. I don't want to have the wing skins down to a 64th of an inch or whatever. So the lightest one, now what I want to do from this point on, the lightest ones are going to go on the inboard panel. I always want to make sure I'm using and I can run my hand on the whole side and figure out which is the best side. In this case, this side is much nicer. So this makes it an easy decision. On Everything has to be vacuumed. Because that dust from sand, and again, we can't do it outside if we could. I don't want any of that dust to wind up. It, it denigrates the glue joint. So every step of the way, even though these skins have been sanded, I know there's a chance they'll have some of that dust on them. And what I want to do is lay the cores out. I want the grain going parallel to the leading edge on these parts. No matter how many times you vacuum, you still wind up with just like balsa dust. It's just part of the problem of building in the winter. Time, if you're doing a one-piece wing, pretend this was a one-piece wing. You, it's a lot, believe me, it's a lot easier. But this is this is going to be a little more complex, but you still get the same the same thing is going to happen. I want to have the glue side down. Uh, in this case, I'll do the smaller of the two parts first. And I want to line this up with, I can take it out of the course for now, line this up with the leading edge. Because what's going to happen when I lay this down, if I lay this down and it's, it's like this, and half of the sheeting's out of the front, I'm dead. So what I need to do is make a little, it, and this is just going to make it. I want to line it up with the leading edge. Just, we are going to make this by about a 64th of, 64th of an inch. Anyway, and I'm going to lay this out, just mark it with a little pencil. Now if you were using epoxy, this wouldn't be critical because you could say, oh, oh, moving it around, oh, and then, but then you would have to leave it in the cores overnight. The method we use is a little bit different. We're going to, we're going to glue this down. We're going to be real careful that the leading edge is parallel. Roll it down. I'm just doing a little practice roll here. But then we're going to have, we're going to put it in a course for about 10 minutes, trim off the front edge, and immediately glue the leading and trailing edges on. So I want to strip off 
from some of the some of the wood that I have it's going to be a quarter inch piece front and back or maybe three of that and again I don't know we're going to have to look at that but the objective is to have everything ready so once you start a panel you get this side done trim it flip it over do the other side put it in a course for a few minutes let that glue really kick off and then glue the leading and trailing edges on to each piece we have four pieces to do so I'm going to allow myself a little bit extra here, but just just to give myself a little parallel line here. Guys, I'll I'll do it with uh, with one of these markers. The trailing edge will be back here, and I don't care about that right now because it's the leading edge that's real important. Now, if you were to a couple of things you can do wrong. If you were to drop this down and it's like you're dead, throw the part away. Throw the throw the core away. And by the way, that's why I had John cut a whole extra set of wings, because I haven't done this in a couple of years. Maybe I'll screw one up. But that's going to be my, that'll be my, now we, the piece for this one. What I was trying to do is get both of them out of one core, and it looks like that's going to happen. Without a problem at all, we'll have this piece. So now I know I don't even have to put glue down at this bottom piece here. And next thing is I'll trim this off. Use this method. It's best to have everything ready to go. And you can see that's one piece. Now what I'll do is I'll also get the other skin ready and I'll strip off the balsa wood part. So everything is ready, almost like making a kit. I don't want to have any extra wood here because I'm just going to waste glue if nothing else. So I don't need that part of the wood. And just for my own reference, I always put something like this. So I know that this is the glue side. Because in essence, I'm building a kit. And I'll do the reverse thing, make the other set of skins, mark them, and I'll lay them all out to make sure I have every, because a lot of times you get doing this, and what will happen is by, by not laying it out ahead of time, you'll lay the wing down and and this won't be the leading edge you'll have the grain going with the trailing edge and then it twists over the front so actually for my own reference see the easier you can make this and on this piece the same thing there's no reason not to do this No matter how you do it, you can be fancy or cute or whatever. But now we have what we hope is going to work out to be. From one set of skins, once I get the rest of the parts all cut out and checked, we'll be ready to glue skins. The part that gets a little tricky is I don't want to make two that don't match. So what I want to do by laying it out this way. This, again, I'm using the glue side. Again, there's a lot of tricks that'll you invent your own tricks as you need them. Leaving at least an inch on all sides is a good trick. And keeping the grain parallel to the leading edge very important. So now we have, once I cut these, I go flip this back, flip this back. Now I know I have, once I cut these up, I have a left and a right here. Again, you know, doing a one piece wing, you just leave this step back, you just make one piece. But always that the grain and that leading edge are very parallel. Let the stripper take into account the, the thickness of the sheeting and strip off some leading and trailing edge pieces. Always want to make these a little bit oversized. Again, they don't have to be the full length, so... When Elliot Scott was here last week, he brought us what amounted to be some 
unbelievably nice balsa, especially the blocks, and some of them are big enough to, I won't have to make the joints like I thought I would. A lot of them are four inch blocks. You know, we want to make sure, and we'll do the leading edge, of course, the same way we have a, all the edges, everything stripped, ready to go before we apply glue. I like to lay it out on the floor, make sure I have everything that I have a top and a bottom. The edges are long enough, I leave about an inch laying off. For each panel, I'll do the other panel off camera and we will be ready. Once the parts are all ready to go, we're ready to start gluing skins on. This is just to help me envision it. I'm not missing any parts. I haven't made two lefts and two rights. I've marked with green what are the heavier of the skins for the outer wing with orange. The lighter of the parts, which for the inner wing, even though that's not a real significant thing, it's just as long as we do have a choice, we may as well do that. And it lets me see for the first time what this wing will look like when it's all in one piece. And this is the most complex wing I've ever built. It has a dihedral angle, a dihedral angle, a dihedral angle. And so normally you would be dealing with one joint. We're going to be dealing with several joints and some pretty, well, if you want to make a B25, that's the price you have to pay. It's just, we don't go to the moon because it's easy. We go to the moon because there's a B25 there. Now tonight it's best we're going to get at best we're going to get an hour of work here so I've set up a little goal what I want to do tonight is get at least get the the skins on and the leading and trailing edges on and then that basically can be drying overnight so I set the leading and trailing edges up out of the way make sure the cores are pressed see that they they have a negative draft angle but I want them to be even with the skins if possible I don't want it to be in or I want it to be out that's important I have the skins and I'm going to lay up one skin, do a little test roll, I'll call it a test roll. And what I do is I take a little piece of tape just to hold the skin because here's what happens when you're working on this. Here's another trick. This is a good one. When you're working late at night like this, have an extra cup of coffee. Hey, just do it. This just keeps it from two little tiny pieces of tape just holding it while it while I'm rolling it. I haven't put the glue on yet, but I want to do my test roll, and it's the leading edge that we're worried about. You see how I have my fingers on the side? They hold the edges of the sheeting. I look down the leading edge. Once I get it in position, roll it. Now we're on a flat part of the table. Press that down, and I can take the tape off. Okay, so it's this side of the cord that I want to spray and this skin in the glue the glue on it I want to get it even with the edge of my table get my little pieces of tape in the corner that's just just so if I don't if I walk by I don't go now it's not ready yet it's gonna sit there for a couple of minutes while it's waiting we'll get the glue on the core again I want to make sure it's this side that I want to spray. Question, we wait for our glue to tack up and it's not tacky yet. This side is. Of course, it's about a minute behind. As soon as this gets tacky. And once it's tacky, you don't have to go and get it on. You have a window, maybe of a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, I'm not sure. But if it did dry out, if you put it on wet, not a good idea. Then the glue never outgasses and you never get rid of all the solvents. So here we go. Here we go. So you do your little test. Now remember, we only get one shot. That's the deal here. We get one time to do this. That's especially true on the leading edge. I want to make sure I got the right tack. The nice thing about this system is if we were using epoxy, may or may not be heavier according to your technique the test scott smith did i think it pretty much came out of draw but but the one thing about this system we can continue working on this tonight assuming we don't have a major house fire or something 
Now, using my fingers to guide this down, as I touch the leading edge, now I'm pressing it. See why I should have had some tape up in the front, I think. Now even we'll put some tape up in the front because it'll pull the tape right up. But you can see the technique I'm using. Again, a lot of this technology was invented by Bob Hunt, Jim Greenaway, Scott Smith, John Duncan, you name who. And I take my little templates, of now part of that, if you're going to count world-class technology, I guess, we'll, I guess we're going to find out. But it's the culmination of everybody's efforts that make these parts possible. And if we were doing a built-up wing or a carbon wing or any other wing, there's one thing a foam wing has over every other way of construction. That is, you can you can pretty much do it in a very short amount of time. Now, see, this is the key thing: is to make sure the front is that I have a good bond up here. I'm going to let that sit for a minute and babysit it. When I say I'll do it off camera, babysit it. Just push it down, push it down. Then I'm going to trim those edges. Time for a new blade, a brand new blade. The reason I say that is I want to make a nice neat cut, but I don't want to go into the foam. I want to cut down this angle. I don't need the tape anymore. I'd like to get right up to the foam, but not beyond it. And we don't need that piece of wood right now. In fact, we don't need this piece either. I can also do a little test with the two sticky pieces of wood just to convince yourself that the glue is, is dry. Press two of them together and try to pull them apart and you'll see, no way. Now, I want to make sure this is all the way up. And I'm going to use the leading edge, even though it has a little bit of glue on it, to guide the blade. I'll hit this with a sanding block before I glue the leading and trailing edges on, but I'd like to get most of it off this way because I don't want the dust contaminating this. Now I can press this up for right now. Now I'm going to repeat the whole procedure on the back right away. Notice I'm not fooling around. You don't want to go and have your coffee now. You want to go have and get this done. Go have your uh, everything ready. Okay, now it's also a good idea because we're going to do this to trim as much of this, leave maybe an eighth of an inch but with that new blade because you need this to work your fingers down and find the sheeting. This acts as your little guide. Now in the past when I've had a lot of wood hanging over, what's happened is I put my finger in, and, and the core is an inch in, inside where I am. So I'll cut some of this off, leave about a quarter of an inch. Again this would apply no matter what. Notice I'm doing the small part first. Now I'm ready to go spray the glue on both, both of these other sides and go right into it. I did have another good tip, uh, which I just forgot and have to relearn, of course. I had the newspaper that I was spraying on. Of course, there's overspray, and I laid the part down, and it sticks to it. Well, every time you spray a new part, lay another layer of newspaper on it. That makes it a little bit easier. Now, if I remember right, let's see if I can remember this. And this is only just to hold it there for that split second that you're trying to lay it down. Because along comes the bird, or along comes a gust of air, or who knows what. This is the one minute of your life you need to have this lay it right down. Now, just need to wait for the glue. Oops. It's warming up. It's warmer now than it was this morning. Warm. It's probably 62 degrees in here. Okay, this is where I wanted the edges trimmed. If I don't have the edges trimmed, and believe me, right now if you drop it, it's back to John Duncan's. But one of the nice things about this is, with a foam wing, you can usually get, and I know John does, I'm not sure if Bob Hunt still does, foam wings that are sheeted, that are ready to put in a plane. And that's really a nice asset. You can see what's happened. We can pull the tape up. We don't need the tape. We have our first panel done in a matter of minutes. 
most important thing again because when you're laying it down is keeping these edges now one of the things you could do if you wanted to I don't do it is leave this in a core overnight instead of doing that I like to get the leading and trailing edges on right away and let the leading and trailing edge glue hold this and act as a clamp Okay, see, I still have a little bit of that contact cement on here from, lay <coughs> from laying it on the newspaper. Okay, now you can see, and I'll do it off camera, I need to trim this, trim that trim, just as I did the other parts, and we're ready to put the leading and trailing edges on before we go do the next piece. Uh, I just want just enough of a sanding block on here so that I get a, a good fit when I glue the leading and trailing edges on. Again, I'll vacuum all the dust up. I made both of these edges oversize. Now, plenty of material to work that leading edge in to the specification that Dave has given us on the plans. Do the same thing on the trailing edge. And the nicest part of this is our B25 will not have any open bays. I did not want to have a B25 with I-beam ribs or open bays or anything, even at some weight penalty. That's a critical thing. A real That would have, uh, in my case, been a negative thing on the model. Now, we have several ways of gluing these on. We could do it with epoxy. That's heavy. Alphatic resin diluted with just a little bit of water is the best way I know of. Let me get the alphatic. I always had this. This is Elmer's Pro Bond paintable, sandable glue. You could use tight bond. Alphatic resin is pretty much the same. What I do, I mix a couple of drops of water in it just so it's a little thinner. Not like water, but a little thinner. Because what happens, the globs that dry, if you don't thin it, are just unbelievable. Now what I'll do is I'm going to paint only this side. Give it a good bond. I don't want to paint the foam because I'm just inducing water down into that wood and I this joint is not a critical joint it's only going on a sixteenth piece of wood anyway but you can see how this will go and we'll do all the edges this way we'll let this sink in for about a minute just let it sit for a minute it usually soaks right into the wood sometimes it puts a warp in the wood if it's not a real good straight grain piece of wood but the idea is that it's thin now once I'll let this sit for a few minutes, I'm just going to lay it up here. Let it sit for a few minutes right now. Otherwise, if it sinks in and there's a dry spot, you don't get it. Another thing you could do here, just to save a little time, because time is always of the essence in my shop, is let both pieces sit for five minutes. You have about a 20-minute window, 15-minute, 20-minute window, before this, this glue starts to set up. Mike Speedalier was the one that showed everybody at one of our club demos this little trick of thinning out the aliphatic. And he, is, he has probably got the best glue joints of anybody I've ever seen. Certainly better than mine. Okay, we're going to let this sit. And then we're not going to paint this side and just, as soon as that's dry, tape it right on. Okay. Now with some masking tape, I'll start in the middle and might work my way to the edges. At the same time, this one is dry. See, I have no glue on this side. Now, this side is dry. The other side has the glue. I'll just lay that right in there. Make sure it's good and straight. Flip it this way. Put a piece of tape right in the middle. I made all these edges, again, oversized. So I have plenty of room to work my radiuses. Now I can start it in the middle and work my way out as far as putting the tape on this. The, the trick is, you see, there's still a little gap there. The reason is because you wet the wood and it formed the boat. That's why you start in the middle. And what we're looking for is a real nice, tight joint, if possible. What we're looking for here is a really tight, tight fit. 
you know, a little bit of glue that oozes out if you wanted to. You could reach in there with a Q-tip, but when we're done this, the Pro Bond is supposed to be sandable aliphatic. To some degree it is, but it's certainly not like, uh, well, like any glue. It's harder than the wood around it. Now, we got that done in a relatively short time. We'll do the other ones off camera, but they're all exactly the same. And then that's pretty much going to sit overnight and dry. Even though you could work on it 45 minutes, an hour later, what happens? You don't want to take a chance that the leading edge is going to come off halfway sanding it. So I find it's better to just let it sit overnight. And tomorrow when we come back to work on it, it'll be no chance it's going to come off whatsoever. And this part, you can see on the tape, goes. if you only had two panels to do, we'd already be half done. It goes relatively quickly. You can do it in an evening session, a morning session, or... Well, you can just pay Johnny Duncan to do it, or Bobby Hunt, or one of the people that do it professionally. I also wanted to mention that uh, Walter Rumland will do sheeted wings, too. I spoke to Walter today. He's interested in doing foam wings, whether you supply the cores, or you don't. But it's always better if you supply the cores, and you supply your own wood, then you know what, the, you know what quality level you're going to build to. All right, we're going to finish the rest of these and we'll be done for the night. Now this is one part of foam wings that everybody likes. This part of it goes very quickly. And again, you could, you could knock this whole thing out in one night. <laughs> Three down, one to go. When you get in, involved at this, at this point in time, each one goes a little faster, and th this is the part of foam wings that really goes quickly, this part right here. Well, in one night session, this all went together. Next step, of course, it's going to dry overnight. And I hope you enjoyed our little uh, Christmas celebration, some of these crazy things going around in our house, off fire. You can't make this stuff. I wish you could make it up. Anyway, the the B25 wing, here we are. Yeah, it's coming. These great blocks, these four inch blocks, I don't know how we're going to use them. We got Walter Rumlin's hats here. We got the fuselage to carve blocks on. We got Miss Ashley to buff out. Well, we just got more things to work on here. I've never, never had a year the year of being busy, but it, it really is a lot of fun. And every time I look at this, I just dream about the day we're going to be able to get this thing out at the field and throttle the engines back, do some taxiing, do some touch and goes. I don't know what else. It's going to be fun. Please share the tapes, and we'll see you on the next tape. And we're almost, we're coming up on New Year's here. It's not New Year's yet, but it's coming up. We're waiting. Actually, uh, 2001 was a crazy year for us. Had a lot of things happen, but it's always nice looking forward to a new year. Hey, and maybe tomorrow we'll get down here and shape up these leading edges and we'll start making our flaps, start carving our blocks. Dreaming about it is more than half the fun. I guess the, I guess the good news is we didn't have to use any of our spare wings, so if anybody out there would like to buy a spare B-25 wing, hey, we'll make you a deal. We'll, make you, we'll give you an offer you can't refuse. And a special thanks to John Duncan, who, uh, in the making of this tape, and I hope he's going to be able to use it in his business for helping people enjoy the uh, the option of having a foam wing, either sheeted or unsheeted. John has certainly come of age and he certainly, we really did have a great time up at his house, like as you can see from the video. And we now have fire extinguishers <laughs> on every wall of this house, thanks to Bill Hummel. Thanks to that stove. I'm kidding, but I, I take very seriously uh, that we might have saved either our shop, our Spitfire bedroom, our house, our lives. And I credit that to Bill Hummel and the article that he wrote in Stump News because it was from that article that we uh, 
we went out and bought all these fire extinguishers. I got them everywhere. I love you. And at the end of every night, this is this is my suggestion. When you walk on this, it's flypaper. By now, every piece of paper here has little dots of contact cement. Get it out of your house, out of your shop as soon as possible. It is flammable, and so that's one of the things we're going to go freeze and clean that up right now. Julie, yeah. I'm really not kidding about laying around a bunch of newspaper with spray glue on it. Not a great idea. Anyway, Tricky agrees. Don't burn the house down, Wendy. Don't burn the house down, Artnowski. Saved all the cores with all their code numbers because this plane is going to have dihedral breaks. So we're not going to be able to do this in the traditional way. And I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but that will give me something to think about tonight. And very special thanks to our friend Elliot Scott, our good friend, who uh, not only has made and maintained my website over the years, but certainly this is something I'll treasure forever. This is a handmade picture, and boy, if that doesn't bring you back to the 50s and the 60s when they used to have these take-apart things, I don't know. Anyway, New Year's Day is coming up. Karen has a couple of days off work. I have no idea what she has planned, but if I can break away down here, I'll get some modeling, and if not, enjoy 2002. Just basically going through some old pictures here and trying to figure out how many foam wing planes in my lifetime have been really excellent flying models and or won major championships. And they've certainly had, we've certainly had our share. I also want to pay, uh, Blue Dutka has been added to the hobby for quite a few years now, but in the years that he cut foam wings and developed things and he was very helpful. And we all benefited from his technology and his craftsmanship over the years. Over the years, we really have built so many foam planes, and I hope this video is going to go a long way to keeping that technology alive and well, even though there are many other ways. Keep in mind, having all these choices is always better than having no choices. And it's the choices we have. When you decide to make a model, the choices you have in motors, fuel tanks, hardware, wing construction, it just makes the hobby so much better when you have choices. So again, we will see you on the next tape, I hope, and I hope you're enjoying the tapes and enjoying sharing our life. There's, there's just something about the medium of video that it allows us to become a closer knit group than any other group of people on the face of the earth before us the times before us maybe not the times after us but having this medium of video to share things with and if you're working on a new project send me some pictures boy there is nothing better than having a lot of old pictures laying around your shop Imagine at one time this was our foam air force, all foam wing planes.